When I was a medical student, I was told that the, by the time you reached your early 20s, that your brain was fully formed. You made no new brain cells. Well, I've got exciting news for you because, in fact, that dogma is absolutely and totally garbage. <laughs> <clears throat> you see, over recent years, our research at the Centre for Brain Research at the University of Auckland has shown that, in fact, we still have stem cells within our human adult brains and that the brain is continuously making new brain cells. So your brain is changing continuously every week, every hour, every minute, and every second. And so today I want to tell you the revolutionary story, the story of our new brain. Now this is a real human brain. It is specially preserved in resin. It is hardened. It travels with me continuously to all my lectures, <laughs> overseas trips. It's my secret companion, my spare brain. <laughs> and when I first saw it as a medical student, I fell in love with it. Because you see, the human brain is the most marvelous, the most complex organ in the human body. It is responsible for who we are and what we are. It determines our potential in life. It's the most valuable, the most vital asset you will ever possess. And you got it for nothing. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Compared with the rat and the monkey brain, the human brain is incredibly complex. You see, the rat brain is sort of the prototype brain. It's got the smooth outer covering on the front, the forebrain. But as you go up through the mammals, that front gets more complex, it gets folded. So by the time you get to the human brain, it has this hugely developed folded forebrain. The rat brain's the Model T, the human brain is the Rolls Royce. And you see, every one of those folds in the human brain, they all contribute in different ways to our conscious existence, to all those complex functions. Right down the middle, you can see that there was the area for movement controlling all your muscles on the other side. Just behind it, the area for sensation, where you consciously appreciate every touch on the skin on the other side. When someone gives you a passionate kiss, you think you feel it on your lips, you don't. You feel it there in the brain, in the sensory area, right at the bottom. The, p the pictures you see are at the back of the brain, upside down. The brain turns them around for you. Memory is in the lower part of the brain. Huge, complex area. Right at the front of the brain is your personality. Your personality and all those higher functional attributes which make you an individual person. It works together with the other side of the brain to give you your particular features which make you the person you are. And so you see... What's most interesting is that we have known since the 1960s that in the rat, cat, and monkey brains, there are stem cells left over from when these animals were embryos, and those stem cells lie in the middle of the brain, and they keep making new brain cells. We call that neurogenesis. Now, if we took a slice through that little rat brain, you'd see diagrammatically Right in the middle of the brain, the area which is enlarged on the side, you see where those stem cells lie, around the ventricles. And they multiply during the adult rat's life. They make new brain cells, little baby brain cells. And those brain cells migrate. They migrate down a motorway from Auckland to Wellington, down to the olfactory area, the front of the brain. And if we look at that motorway, that neurogenesis motorway and higher power from an actual section of the rat brain, you'll see how complex it is, how beautiful it is going forwards. And if you were to do experiments on the rat and can kill cells in the front there, which would mimic a stroke, or areas which would mimic Parkinson's or Huntington's disease, then those little baby brain cells pass and migrate 
and replace the lost brain cells and repair the brain. But we have known and been told that the human brain has no stem cells. I was told as a medical student, I was told, and I taught that up to some years ago, just a few years ago, that the human brain could not make new stem cells. As a, when I graduated from medicine about, oh, 40 years ago, quickly, <laughs> I had a passion and interest in the brain, so I pursued neurosurgery. And I suddenly realised we knew very little what was going inside the brain. And so I decided to go back and then start a career in brain research. You can't do experiments on the human brain, but you can do experiments on the rat brain. So I became a little bit of an expert on the rat brain. Studied inside the rat brain, the area called the basal ganglia, which controls movement, which is affected in, Alzheimer's, which is affected in Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. And um, one day, in 1980, something happened which changed my life. The professor of genetics came to see me. And he said, Richard, you are an expert on the basal ganglia, the area affected in Huntington's disease, this tragic disease, which is caused by a dominant gene passing from one generation to the next. And that gene kills brain cells, as you know. And those brain cells sit right in the middle of the basal ganglia. You see one section through Huntington's brain on the right, where those basal ganglia cells have died and it's shrunken completely. On the left is the normal brain. And he said, we don't have a test for the gene, but the families passionately want to know whether or not they have this disease in the family. Would you look at the brains of their mum and dads when they die for the families? and see if they show the typical pathology of Huntington's disease so they know whether or not they have this tragic disease in the family. So I said, sure, in my naivety, why not? I'll help wherever I can. And so he would turn up every few months with a brain from a family whose mum or dad had just died, brain fixed and formed and brought to the lab and said, look at this brain Tell us what the answer is. Tell the family. So we did that. And we took brains from as far north as Wangarain all the way down to Invercargill over the years. And we would communicate that back to the families, tell them. In most cases, it was unfortunately yes. In virtually all the cases, it was yes. But in the odd case, it was no. And it was like giving them a million dollars. But what the families did was something very, very special. I never expected. They said, you keep the brain of mum. You do research on it. You find out why the cells are dying. And you help our kids. And that's what we did. And in order to understand what changes were going on in the brain, we'd have to talk back to the families. We talked and got all more details on the history. We ended up talking also to the doctors, gaining more information. And so we were developing unconsciously a network, a network, a partnership, a creative partnership between families, scientists, and doctors. And that was a partnership which has grown and developed in our centre. And then as we found out, we unraveled the disease and found out more about the brain, we got unexpected results. One of the most exciting, unexpected results, the Eureka moment, was when we looked at our Huntington's brains and found, my God, they're making new brain cells. That meant there must be stem cells in the human brain. And then the normal brain on the left there, you can see this little band of stem cells are making new brain cells. But in the Hunt Huntington's brain, they're making more. You see, they're trying to repair the brain. That was a eureka moment, but it was controversial. And we knew that we were going to have problems convincing the scientific community, which had and believed the dogma the human brain could not make new brain cells. So we knew we had to demonstrate the neurogenesis motorway in the human brain. We had to find, find 
whether or not there was a neurogenesis motorway in the human brain like that in the rat brain. So we've got our PhD students at work. They sectioned the brain from front to back, thousands of sections, did special staining. We looked for it. This Auckland to Wellington motorway, you see, we were crossing it. We were cutting sections across the North Island. Very hard to see a motorway sometimes when you cut across it. And so we saw little hints of it, but we couldn't join up the dots. And so we thought anew and said, let's turn this question around and try and answer it a different way. Instead of coming from the front to the back, let's take big blocks of the brain out. And let's section from the midline out, take longitudinal sections along the North Island to see if we could capture segments of the motorway which would be easier to join together. And that's what we did. And we joined them together. In fact, we found segments on successive sections going over several millimetres, centimetres. Put them together. Three years' work. One slide. And we found the motorway. <laughs> and that motorway... Looked like this, you see, when you chart it, we thought it went backwards. It didn't go straight forwards like the rat brain. It curved around and then doubled back on itself towards that smaller smell region of the human brain. It was Eureka, we'd found it, but why is it so different? Well, if you take the rat brain and convert it into a human brain, you can do that by shrinking down that smell area at the front, because in the human brain that's very small, but expanding up the cortex, the forebrain, into lots of folds, you distort it. It's like turning that brain through 70 degrees. You start to get the picture of what we were seeing in the human brain. And so, you see, we explain that difference in shape because of differential specialization of the human brain. So we thought, fantastic, let's publish this, and let's go for the top science journal in the world. There are two top science journals, Nature in the UK, Science in the US. We went to Nature. We put it together, packaged it together. My God, we're going to be famous, you know. <laughs> wow. Of course, the paper went in, sent out to referees, the top experts in the field. You know, the Goliaths of stem cell research who had published papers before saying there's no such thing as a neurogenesis motorway in the human brain. They'd looked for it, they hadn't found it. How come this little group of New Zealanders think they can do better? <laughs> and so we were absolutely done by the referees who said, no way, Jose. We reject this paper, we do not believe these results unless they actually take sections and keep them alive in the lab and show this motorway and show the cells migrating. Well, I only have one life. And we decided, well, they rejected the journal, they rejected the, the, our paper and sent it back to us. And we were devastated. Being Kiwis, we repackaged the results. We thought and added more information to it. We just were not going to take this lying down. And so we added more sections. We did more studies. We did different cell counts. We did additional stains. And we repackaged it and put more information together. And we sent it off to the other journal, Science. That went to a different set of referees, you see. Those who we imagined were much more open, didn't have a stake in the field, and the answer came back, yes, we will accept this. It makes sense that there is a motorway for neurogenesis in the human brain. It lies at the top of the mammalian scale, and the different shape, that all makes sense too. They said, there's lots of things to find out, and we must do more research. Obviously, we need to do more research, and they asked for additional findings. But they said yes, and they accepted it. And we got it published in Science. We not only got it published in the journal, but we were featured on the front cover. And I always say... <laughs> thank you. For a scientist, for a scientist, you see, that's even better than being on the centerfold of Playboy. <laughs> and so, you see, the human brain makes new brain cells. This is revolutionary. It's still controversial. And in a way, in a humble sort of way, it's a bit like 
showing that Galileo showed in the 1600s that the moon went around, the, the sun went around the, sorry, we'll start again, that the, <laughs> <laughs> that the earth went around the sun, and not the other way around, the heliocentric universe. And he was actually, for such a controversial idea, the church put him under house arrest for the rest of his life. We're lucky, we're still free. <laughs> What's so important though is that because we have these findings in the human brain, it shows that there is a similar comparable pathway but more complex than that in the animal brains. So therefore what you find in animals you can apply to the human. So we know that in rats, the more you excite rats, the more you put them into an enhanced or stimulating environment, the more new brain cells they make. The more exercise you give them, the more new brain cells you make. So you see, the more you stimulate humans, the more you exercise, the more you use your brain, the more new brain cells you'll make. And so, creative thinking makes new brain cells. Use it or lose it. The sort of things your grandmother told you. So you see, we have lots of challenges ahead. We've got to see if we can make these brain cells faster. Try and work out how we can stimulate the normal and the diseased human brain to make more new brain cells from the stem cells we have in our brain. Are there motorways coming off? The main motorway, which goes to regions which will appear in Huntington's and Parkinson's and stroke and Alzheimer's disease to repair the brain. And so, you see, this is your incredible human brain. It's changed over the last 15 or 16 minutes. Maybe you've been stimulated and made new brain cells. <laughs> so use it to its maximum to fulfill your dreams and passions in life, to expand your mind. And always remember, science is about people, and science is about dreaming. Thank you.